thank you for your patience. I know everyone's hungry and everyone wants to eat, but uh, please allow me a couple minutes of your time. Uh, and uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Well, uh, uh, we've seen a lot of advanced surgeries before me, before this presentation. How about simplifying stuff a bit? Uh, ever since we started placing implants, the main goal was to restore patients with the best of aesthetics and function. However, with the advancement of surgeries, with more advanced surgeries, the challenge was a bit harder. How can we still get to the patient the best result of aesthetics and function and avoid these kind of surgeries? So the main question today is, can advanced surgeries be avoided? First of all, it's the patient coming to you uh, and they don't want to go with, with advanced surgeries. Can you find them a better viable option and still get the same result without going to these advanced surgeries? The age of the patient. Patients are getting older. They have more systemic problems. So they don't want to go to advanced surgeries. Can we avoid advanced surgeries and still have the best result? The resources. We all know how these advanced surgeries cost money. Can we, again, avoid these uh, advanced surgeries? Aesthetic demands and function, we talked about it. The anxiety, we know how much patients are anxious about going to advanced surgeries. One of the main reasons we can try to avoid them, and medical condition. So basically today, uh, by, by avoiding these kind of surgeries, reduce the time needed to complete the treatment, do it in a faster time, reduce the morbidity and complication, reducing cost, quite logical, but never reducing quality. Again, simplifying is not compromising, providing equal success rate. So today we'll be talking about four different techniques. First of all is short implants, short implants in mandible, short implants in maxilla. Obviously, with the long-term follow-up, and how predictable is that, and supported by literature. And also the use of narrow implants, in, so height and width. With the use of angled implants, tuberosity implants, the use of septas <coughs> in the sinus, to avoid uh, advanced surgeries such as sinus lift. The all on four treatment, we'll talk about it briefly, since it was talked about this morning. And finally, implants placed laterally to the alveolar nerve. Let's start first with a short implant in the deficient posterior maxilla and the benefit from septum when you have polyrobated sinuses. So, we work in an environment that has been placing implants for the past 35 years, and I'm lucky enough to have everything that some a lot of cases that come in with long term follow. These are the early cases that have been placed with short implants back in 1991. These are all screw vent implants. This is it some 20 years later, in 2011. So these implants have stood the test of time for more than 20 years. These are short 7 millimeter implants, splinted. And yet, you see no bone loss around them. And why do you see all these cases, successfully treated cases, 6 years post-op, 9 years post-op, another 9 years post-op? or eight years post-op, you start asking yourself, is this a predictable option? Can you do it on your daily basis? Take a look at this case, for example, where the patient did not want to go for sinus lifting, tried to avoid these advanced surgeries. He's suffering from an anodontically uh, involved tooth in the premolar. <clears throat> uh, the tooth was extracted, and a temporary bridge was completed with a palatal amputation of the more. This is all a temporary solution for a couple of months. The patient was then restored, and this is four years later with three implants, three short implants, avoiding the sinus. So this, this is a viable option. Uh, yet again, other cases where we dared more to, to use, with a very limited sub-sinus height, we dared more to use short implants. This is six years post-loading with six millimeter implants. Yet again, the trend here we try to observe is splinting, is a better option and increases the survival rates. This is it, 11 years post-loading. 
Another case where we uh, used 11.5 uh, by 375 implants split into a 7 by 5 implant. Now, many of you here will see that ah, this is a case of science. Today. But this is it in 2017, 11 years post op. So, short implant is a viable option, and the literature has proven that, it has shown that it supports us in this thinking. Yet again, the trend is to splint these crowns, especially in the maxilla, to have an inadequate success rate of about 90%. Now, we tried to push the envelope a bit more, we tried to see if these short implants were viable options if they were single crowns. Here, for example, a very limited bone height, where we placed short implants, seven by six implant here in this case, as a single tooth restoration. This is 24 months post-loading, and this is 10 years post-loading. Seven by six. Now, this is not the only rule. Here we were quite lucky. The, the Prosthetic parameters were in favor, the occlusion was in favor. We had no bone loss, this is 10 years post story. But we were not that lucky all the time. Here, for example, where we used a 7 by 6 implant as a single crown, restoration worked out perfectly well for the first, for the first four years. This is in 2010, and yet at the fourth year we had a loss of integration. This is due to poor bone quality and obviously the loss of integration due to excessive occlusive forces. This later was replaced with sinus tip and two implants. If you look at the literature, at these short six millimeter implants with single crowns, at three years they have very, very similar success rate that compared to external sinus tip and regular length implants. Another article showing at five years what happens to those. Well, the success rates tend to go a bit lower. Here, in this case, 86%. So, it's a viable option. What we have observed clinically is that it's much better to split them with longer implants or together to avoid this kind of unsuccessful results. Another trick is to take advantage of the septum. A septum, when you have a multi-lobated sinus and, sub and septas, uh, it's very, very uh, useful to use this kind of uh, the septums itself. These are cortical bones and you can anchor the implant with a proper, proper torque. To so take advantage of the septum, here we can use a regular length diameter and restore the patient with a single crown. Here, for example, where we use the septum and also restore the patient with a single crown. Septums are really good. You just have to aim right to really focus it, to, to hit it properly. This is it, a couple of years later. Now, for the maxilla, this is it. Let's see what the short implant in the deficient mandible has to offer us. Again, looking back uh, retrospectively at uh, long-term cases, these are the first, one of the first cases what we did in our facility back in 1990 with old screw band implants. As you can see, limited, limited and short implants with a deficient crown to move Front to implant ratio. Yet again, these implants stood the test of time. This is it, 19 years later. Now, the patient came back not because of, of a problem, he just wanted to have his crowns re veneered. This was all uh, metal on acrylic. And so he did. We had them re veneered, and the implants were perfectly integrated. Other cases where we had long term follow up with successful rate, this is seven years post op. This is another. Uh, f uh, almost 15 years post op. And here, this is it also with seven years post op. So, viable option. Let's see, this is also a nice case 15 years post op, where we have uh, 8.5 8 by 375, 7 by 4, and 6 by 5. These are short implants, splinted together. Trying to splint together to reduce these occlusive forces and reduce these offset, offset forces and to preserve much more the very implant bone. Take a look at this case in 2001 with deficient bilateral uh, posterior mandible. You can go with augmentation, obviously, in that case, but another good option is short implants. 
This is all back in the CT scan uh, time. You can see a very deficient height of them, about 8 millimeter and here about 6 millimeter in the back. This is the same result nine years later. We have an 8 by 5 by 4, the anterior, and two 6 by 5 implants. They do perfectly well. The trick here is to, again, to control the prosthetic parameters. Control forces, distribution equally, and try to stay as much as possible in the axis, axis of the implant. Offset courses will cause disturbance in the prosthesis, ceramic chipping, screw loosening, bone loss. This is the contralateral side that will be stored with 6x5 and 8.5x4. Nine years later. Take a look here at this case, a bit more extreme, where we had a narrow ridge and a short ridge. This become more challenging. When we have enough width, we compensate the height by width. When we have enough, and we don't have uh, width too. This is also a challenge. This is it. Uh, uh, let's say, take a look at the cone beam CT uh, uh, pre-op. You can see a narrow ridge, and the, in the premolar area, the molar area we barely have six millimeter above the nerve. Here we. Uh, this is a post. Uh, implant placement, where we can see we place a narrow implant, 3.3 by 8 in the premolar, and two 6 millimeter implant in wide diameter. This is a clinic on both sides. Two years later, an excellent uh, result. We also added to the right side a free gingival graft to increase the keratinized tissue. Now, some literature has good evidence and good support of this. Narrow implants. Uh, Paolo Malo uh, published a study in 2017 showing uh, narrow implants and short implants. And they have viable options, survival option, about 93% of success rates. Uh, another also uh, study on 5 to 10 year clinical and uh, retrospective study showing really good results, 92% success rate. So it's a viable option. Yet again, the trend is to split them. Split them reduces the force and distribution of the force is much better. More extreme cases, where we had very limited height above the mandibular nerve, we used a 4 millimeter stroma implant in that case. Splinted to a bit longer, 6 millimeter implants, and this is two years later, with a great follow-up. Again, the literature about this 4 millimeter implant is also a viable option, yet again, they insist on Splinting these crowns. We all know that the canal position in the mandible, this is a human study, done in 2004, 30% is in the upper third, 70% is in the lower third. So, one, one out of three, 30% uh, of the cases you're dealing with canals that are very close to the coronal part, then a short implant is a great option. However, we were, we were not as lucky. Always, we sometimes have complications, even with splitting crowns. So, this is it 15 years post op with failure of short implants. And this is it, two years post, uh, post uh, loading. Obviously, failures come in from different perspectives and different reasons. It could be from the prosthesis itself, it could be from the, uh, the patient itself. <coughs> However, it's not always successful. It's very important to tell. We're never 100% successful. It's important to control the prosthetic parameters, the offset forces, the compressive stress, and the critical bending moment. All these prosthetic parameters were part of the study that were completed by our team in 2006. And uh, the, when they analyze is properly the, the, the prosthesis uh, in, in regards to the implant and the forces in regards to the extra distribution. When uh, the, the implant were properly angled and the forces of the occlusion were properly distributed, we had less bone loss and obviously less bone remodeling. One factor they looked into it also was to crown to implant ratio, <coughs> where we found that about, uh, the major part of our study group, 60 here, was about uh, 1.2 to 1.4 implant to, to, to crown ratio. 
They also compared this infant to ground ratio in regards to the bone loss around it. And they found out that even with the deficient two, uh, if you see in this category here, two, meaning the implant to crown is two, meaning a long, a long crown, more or less the bone loss was about the same. So, short implants in the mandible is a viable option, it's a great option. And it, it comes in instead of advanced surgeries, it will reduce the cost, it will reduce the trouble. However, it should be used properly and it should have a, a, a good understanding of prosthesis uh, and the distribution of forces. I, I keep on insisting on this, it's so important. Another category we'll talk about is the angled implant to bypass the vital structures. Take a look at this case. Now, how many, uh, this is back in 2003. Now, how many of you would do a sinus dip if you see this kind of, this kind of situation? Many of us. Here, the patient did not want to go for advanced surgeries. Said, Doc, can you do something to avoid or try to do something faster? Yes, we can. Obviously, here, 2003, we avoided the sinus by doing angled implants. This is it, 15 years later, 2018. An excellent result, an excellent bone stability, and this is even using these old Vanomark implants, external hex implants. With the proper uh, realization and the proper planning, obviously, when you get to the surgery part, it's quite easy. You should not, you should aim uh, into not hitting the sinus and angling the implant here is a good option. Using the tuberosity also is a great option. And bypassing the sinus is a great option. You obviously will reduce the cost, reduce time. It takes six months for a sinus tip to be in general. Here in the case, you bypass the sinus and use the tuberosity. And uh, within three months, the patient was rehabilitated. It's a good option. Take a look at this case, where we, a patient came to us with failed implants in the anterior maxilla. Look at uh, closely here at the cone beam CT. You can see uh, complete uh, loss of the buckle plate on these implants. He wanted to have faster solution, not involving any wound grafting. He was already traumatized with surgery. He did not, not, not want to have more advanced surgeries. So what to do? What we plan to do is bypass these vital structures, the sinus, use the chiborosity, angle the implant here, try to, to use as much as possible the anterior maxilla, knowing that it was limited height, and again, angle the implant here and using the fibrosity here. So, try to go around, try to fit the patient's demand, yet again, never compromising the result. Placing implants in native bone, not in augmented bone, so reduces the time of treatment significantly. We can uh, uh, then deliver also an immediate denture, an immediate temporary denture for the patient at the same time of surgery, uh, within the week of surgery. So a great service for the patient we can render. Let's go to the case. This is it. Uh, clinically, we then, uh, the flaps were, uh, mucoperiosal flap was open. We extracted, explanted these fake implants and uh, placed uh, the implants as planned, one angling to avoid the sinus, another two implants in the front, in the anterior uh, maxilla. This is the uh, situation on the right side. So as you see here, one in the tuberosity, one angled right at the edge and limit of the sinus. We have three implants here. We sutured and then attacked the left side on the same appointment, obviously. These, all these implants were torqued at 35 newtons. This is it on the other side, where we angled the implant again to avoid the sinus and use the chiporosity. As you can see here, this is all done within one hour. The patient was then restored immediately, within 48 hours, with an immediate temporary. So this option versus going to advanced surgeries, waiting a long time, this is a very good option. We, we only had to load uh, the prosthesis on six implant, and obviously a couple of months later, when all integrated, we uh, completed the case with a full mouth rehabilitation. So the angled implant, 
How is that comparable to straight loans? This is a study done in 2017 showing similar success rates, angled or straight. Yet again, other studies showing <clears throat> no difference in longevity nor bone loss or screw loosening between straight and angled abutments. Especially with these new uh, type of connections we have, connected, uh, connections, really no difference in, uh, in, in success rates. Same here, uh, studies in 2000 showing survival rates similar for a group of 0 to 25 degrees in the abutment and 20 to 45 degrees. So it's a good option. Yet again, demanding surgically, we put pressure on ourselves much more, but render the patient service and go much faster with the treatment. Another third option is the all on four. I mean, we've discussed about this a lot, uh, a lot this morning. I'm going to go briefly on it. All on four is in the treatment of the posterior man uh, of, of the edentulous mandible, is a great option. We use uh, implants within the foraminal area and place uh, the implants at the 30, 30 degree angle. This is a lot of cases we have treated uh, successfully and immediate loading, obviously, of the prosthesis. Here, a nice case where we did all on four in the mandible and also all on six in the maxilla, avoiding the sinuses here with this implant. So, a treat, a, this kind of technique we use on a daily basis in our practice. This is the final result of that case. A little look back at our, at our own patient. This is a, a retrospective analysis that was not published. Uh, we did more than uh, 144 lumbar implants immediately loaded on following the all on four protocol. We had excellent success rate, 98% of success rates. So it's a viable option and uh, we use it very, very regularly in our practice. Now the last, the last technique that I really want to show you is something that we don't see every day. Implant placed at lateral to the inferior girl nerve. This is a patient that went through advanced surgery. And bone grafting uh, done with, the, with the advanced surgeries and these bone grafting did not heal well. They all failed. So he came to us with a lot of trauma, psychological trauma and obviously the trauma itself. He wanted to have the best option without going to surgeries again. So some, uh, oftentimes the parietal bone, yeah, you lose them. 50% of the time you can lose them. So here he wanted to have an option of treatment without going to advanced surgeries. Furthermore, into analysis of the CT scan, if you look into it, this is the uh, anterior side where you still have some bone left, maybe 8 millimeters. The middle side about 6 millimeter like, uh, of bone height left. And the posterior side, where really you have an adequate width of bone lateral to the nerve. Obviously, no bone height above the nerve with the terrible bone quality here. So the idea came to place implants lateral to the nerve. This is it, planning prior implant placement. This is it in clinic. We placed the two implants, one regular implant, one above the alveolar nerve, and one lateral to the alveolar nerve. Obviously, it is sticking out in the vestibule. Sometimes we need to do a vestibuloplasty or a gingival graft to, to array or fix this uh, gingival contour to increase the gratinized gingival here. Most of the time, the patients end up with cross pipe occlusions, but this is quite fine. They can function properly. Let's take a, take a look at the comb beam or CT, back to CT scan back in the days. Uh, post implant placement. This is the first. This is the second implant, right above the, uh, the alveolar nerve. And this is it, lateral to the alveolar nerve. Now, nowadays, with the new technology, it's uh, useful to use a guided surgery in, that, in these cases. These were done freehand. This is the result some three years post on. A very viable result. Last case. Also about the same situation where you can find a good amount of bone in the premolar area. And here we had a good amount of bone lateral to the alveolar nerve. And practically no 
own height, I mean three to four millimeters only, above the mantle nerve. This was a good site to use with cortical bone and hard bone, uh, which is a better, better option to using, let's say, a, a, a short implant here and a, 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 a this deficient mandible in height. And we had enough bone lateral to the nerve. We used this bone. This is, go, this is going clinically into the case where we uh, place the implant, the first implant, in a regular way, and these two in a completely lateral way. Obviously, we need more soft tissue management. And uh, the wild drilling, wild drilling, it is uh, clever to take a cone beam CT to make sure you're still lateral to the nerve. This is not freehand, obviously, if you do it with the guided, it's less headaches. Yet again, these implants were placed properly. We also managed to do a vestibuloplasty. This is a co-pack day. This is it at uh, uh, two months later. And this is the final arch relationship that we anticipated with the crossbite. The patient was rehabilitated in two to three months. It's a great option. Simplifies, but never, but never compromise. Uh, an interesting study showing that 28% the sites in mandibles could be could fit a 375 implant lateral to the nerve. So we could use this kind of uh, sites. Obviously, these are for advanced surgeons, but with the venue of uh, guided surgery, it becomes easier. Also, another, a, another interesting uh, idea was to use angled implant. This is a study done uh, on 56 patients. Now, 10 of them suffered from paresthesia, and these implant design exists uh, yet to be proven. So in conclusion, short implants, narrow implants in the maxilla or mandible are viable options. Angled implant to avoid the sinus, use these septas, use the tuberosity is a viable option. The oral on four treatment, obviously, is a viable option. And in specific cases with proper uh, diagnosis and proper execution, the implant placed lateral to the nerve is a viable option. It's very important to remember that simplifying is never compromising. And I thank you all for your attention.